Welcome to the first module in this forest bathing series. If you haven't watched the introduction video to learn about how to use this material or about me, your guide Tia Ho, and my colleague Irene Bailey, I just invite you to head over to that introductory video so you can learn a little bit more about what this series is about and about us. This very first module, Foundations in Science and the More Than Human World, at the end of it, we hope that you'll be able to communicate what forest bathing as forest therapy is, relate mindfulness to forest bathing sensory practices, and describe examples of how forest therapy is a mental and physical health support based on research. And because this is a forest bathing series, I like to start role modeling what we actually do out in the field. So I'm just going to provide you a welcoming invitation, and any of these invitations, like they sound, are up to you to adapt and change based on what works best for you. So you can modify something. If, for example, in this particular one, I invite you to let your eyes wander to this image of moss on the screen, you also might want to look outside of a window, or you might choose to look at a plant right where you are. You don't have to look at the picture of the moss. And if you don't want to look at any of these, you just want to close your eyes, you can do that as well. If it feels good, imagine breathing in the scent of a mossy forest, knowing it is creating oxygen for you and receiving the carbon dioxide from you. I wonder how you could give it thanks. And while your eyes are gently looking at this picture of moss or they're looking at a plant or looking at outside the window. I'm just going to invite you to let your gaze soften and let the eyes wander and explore the variety of textures or colors that come out to meet it. And if you've decided to have your eyes closed just to take a moment, I just invite you to take two of the longest and deepest inhalations and exhalations you've taken today. Thank you for arriving into this space with me. This particular image here on the right is a picture of the map of the Tri-County region from nativeland.ca. That is a map that's coming out of Canada. A number of people are updating a database regularly to show the original, spe original peoples before colonialism tried to conquer the entire world to show us where people live. And it's important in arriving into the experience of being on this land to help us give gratitude to all that have come before us and continue to tend these lands and waterways. The place we call Portland is on original land of the Chinook, Kalapuya, and Malala Native communities. And when I contacted the Chinook Nation to make sure that I was giving them proper credit for certain things in my business, they let me know that it's important to inform people that these groups and all of the tribes within them are now part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. There are many more tribal communities that utilize the Columbia and Willamette Rivers and that are also part of a vast network, trading network that has spanned the North, Central, and South Americas that we're not mentioning here because these are the folks who, who mostly lived in this region. And we are here because of sacrifices that were forced on these original peoples. And it's our intention through the work that we do that we help ensure that we find ways to repair this relationship, both with the land, the people, and the more than human world. In connecting to the land, we can start to bring awareness to this vast world all around us. Our society, which is run now using a lot of principles that came out of that colonialist history, 
really encourages us to separate ourselves from this natural systems that we are actually a part of. Life is living us in the very same way that life is living a tree, that life is living these different plants and the beings and the animals that are all in this in these various systems. And we are part of these wonderful systems and it's part of forest bathing to start recognizing and recovering that connection. So I just want to say thank you for being on this path with us in introducing yourself to the healing supports of forest and natural systems and in seeking ways to give back to the the earth that is our home and all of the beings or as Robin Wall Kimmerer likes to say, the personhood that is part of every being beyond humans. And this is part of why we like to say the the beyond human or more than human world. This may be something you're already familiar with, or it might be the first time you're starting to consider and are embarking on your own discovery process. So welcome. One of the components of forest therapy is that forest, these forested environments can be a healer. And one of the ways that that happens is by listening to your own aliveness within you and letting that guide you in the same way that nature guides all the other beings around us. And so when was the last time you noticed feeling the deep support of the land around you? We take for granted that gravity is gently holding us up and that every morning we wake up and breathe in air and receive sunshine and receive rain and that thousands of different things happen before a fruit arrives in our hands. This more than human world and the beings within us are all part of nature and we can be in partnership with it. So I just invite you to kind of think a little bit about that and discover, you know, as you're on a walk, maybe thinking a little bit about the fact that life is dividing your cells in the same way that it's encouraging flowers to bloom and petals to drop. Another aspect of forest bathing is letting your senses wander and encouraging your being to play in the natural world. So when was the last time you wandered in the forest or a natural area like a park without an agenda? So you weren't there for exercise, you weren't there to meet somebody, you were just there to explore and see you, see what you could see and hear what you could hear. And if you haven't done that in a really long time, or maybe ever, I'm just going to invite you this week to go outside and let your, let your senses take over, even if it's only for five minutes to explore and get curious and play with whatever it is that's coming out. Forest bathing comes from these Japanese concepts called Shinrin Yoku, which literally means forest bath or bathing in a forest atmosphere. Kind of like taking the forest in through our senses. And this quote here by Dr. Ching Li, who wrote this book on the, that's pictured on the right, Forest Bathing, How Trees Can Help You Find Health and Happiness. In this quote, he's pointing out that connecting with nature through our various senses is how we also can connect to that natural world. And when we're indoors, we often are only engaging two senses, our eyes and our ears. And when we're outside, we can actually engage a whole host of both external and internal senses. So I've listed a couple of different definitions from places that provide training in certifying forest forest therapy and forest bathing guides. The first is from the Association of Nature and Forest Therapy, and it refers to the practice of spending time in forested areas for the purpose of enhancing health, wellness, and happiness. And the second one from the Forest Therapy Institute talks about forest therapy and forest bathing basically as a type of intervention that helps target specific mental health and physical health difficult. And forest therapy is part of a larger umbrella called ecotherapy that's really working with people's 
affinity for a connection with nature and a reciprocity between people in nature as well as our social relationships to help support people's health and well-being. Being able to connect with the world around us relates to our capacity to connect with how we feel. And the capacity to find supports in nature is also related to the capacity to find supports internally. So a forest or natural area becomes this backdrop to supporting the brain and body physically and the heart and soul figuratively. So I just want to say thank you for starting on this path with us. We're going to dive into a little bit about how forest bathing is also a mindfulness practice. So mindfulness is basically attention training. It's directing your attention on purpose into your present moment-to-moment experience without judging or analyzing it. And that last piece, this is a definition from John Kabat-Zinn, that last piece is a little bit misleading because it's not that your mind doesn't judge or analyze. That's actually your brain's job. It's one of your brain's jobs. You have a portion of your uh, brain that is devoted to categorizing things because it's how it makes sense of the environment around you. And your brain is making predictions all the time based on past experiences and several other ingredients to create emotions and to make understanding. Um, It's literally simulating your experience before you actually have it. As a result, it's not, we can't actually turn off that internal judger or turn off analysis. Your mind is just going to do that. But what can happen is that as you learn how to direct your attention, you can nudge your mind and nudge the attention within it to let that judgment and analysis drift past. And what people are finding through research on mindfulness is that it can increase self-awareness, it can increase your ability and capacity to pay attention, and there are actually different forms of attention, which I'll get into in another slide, and to regulate your emotions. And emotional regulation isn't about control. It's not about never feeling a certain way or only feeling one way on demand. It's about when emotions show up in the system, knowing how your system functions in order to support that system so that as the emotion moves through, you just have a little bit more capacity for being with it. It's it's really about changing your relationship to emotions. And research on people who practice different forms of mindfulness indicates that they start feeling more clarity, ease, awareness, focus, and even compassion for themselves and others, depending on whether or not they're practicing a type of uh, mindfulness practice, which is really focused on the heart and, and on compassion. Part of this becomes really helpful because one of the things about that judgmental analysis mind is that that portion of our mind is also generating very imaginative thinking processes about things that could happen in the future or things that happened in the past or sometimes even rewriting what the past was through a different lens. And your body actually, your physiology responds to the thinking that your mind generates in nearly the same way as if you were in an actual real event that you had to respond to. So, for example, if I was ever bitten by a snake, having uh, thoughts about that would be as stressful to my body as the real-time moment of responding to a snake bite. The point about this and the reason that I'm bringing up in a forest bathing uh, practice is that Those things aren't actually happening. And the more that you can bring awareness and learn how to use your senses, especially in natural settings, to help stabilize the nervous system, the more you can start to notice, oh, this is just just where my mind is taking me. It's not actually something I need to do something about right in this immediate moment. And sensory practices can help settle our nervous system. So as I mentioned, your brain uses four ingredients to create emotions, and stress is a major emotion that it can create. And in addition to past experiences that you've had, your mind also uses bodily sensations and your senses, where you put your attention, and the current cues from your environmental context, so those sensory inputs, to generate emotions. And I bring this up because... We tend to think about our bodies and our emotions and things like stress as though we can control them. 
but there's a lot that's happening all the time that we're not in charge of. So for example, your brain is generating thought all the time and you're not actually fully in charge of the fact that it does that. Just like you're not in charge of the fact that your body, your heart is beating and your lungs are breathing, your cells are dividing, my body's making saliva as I'm trying to talk. All of this is considered automatic activity, but I like to think of it as life living you. It's the same kind of life that's dividing cells in the trees. It's the same kind of life that's uh, the reason, you know, different animals scamper about and go get the walnuts out of the walnut tree. <laughs> Part of that autonomic nervous system are, is your peripheral nerves that come out of your brain and spinal cord. And you've got a division called the sensory division, which is part of those outside senses that we normally talk about when we say the word sense. And your inside senses, which is, are a whole set of other feeling states within your body that your brain uses uh, to generate emotions like stress. And that can include feelings like hunger. It can uh, include balance and where you feel like you are in space. And the reason that I'm including all of this in a lecture about forest bathing is that when you start tuning into your senses and gaining awareness in both how your bodily feelings are and the different things that are happening outside of your system through those external senses, the more you can actually work with what's called your vagus nerve. That's actually not in your peripheral nervous system. It is a nerve that comes directly from your brain into your body and it connects to all of your major organs and it regulates your heart rate, it regulates your breathing rate, it actually is related to your immune system and certain types of inflammation and it helps regulate your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. And the reason that I bring this up here is that the more that you start learning about how your body relates to sensory practices like forest bathing, the more that you can use those sensory practices to help support your nervous system in settling. And you can do that both with breathing practices and with turning your attention into your senses. So your sympathetic nervous system is really important because it helps you use energy. It's what's responsible for what we call the word stress, but you can't actually get things done without stress. Like I couldn't be giving this presentation without feeling a little bit of my sympathetic nervous system turning on. It's just how we function. And at the same time, that system, if it gets turned on really high for too long, that can be really hard on the body. So your parasympathetic nervous system is how you save or conserve energy. It's the freeze portion of fight, flight, freeze when we talk about stress. And it's also part of recovery. So when you've been feeling a little bit of stress, you can use different practices in your toolkit to help dial it down. And forest bathing can be one of those practices. That's part of why we put this e-course together so that you can start playing with different senses in the third module to start experiencing a little more awareness about how your system functions and what can help you turn down the notch in your stress system. So where you place your attention can shape your thoughts, your feeling, your sensation, and your emotion experiences. Let's try a little bit of an applied practice and we'll do some of the things that are similar to this out in the field. You can do the sitting, standing, you can do this lying on your back, you can have your eyes closed or your eyelids lowered, whatever feels most comfortable. And what I'm gonna do is, this is, this is basically a little practice to help you tune into your sound sense. So what's coming in through your ears. So you might wanna take off one of your earphones if you have, have them on for this. And what's gonna happen is I'm gonna ring a chime and you're welcome to tune into the sound of that chime until it fades. And then when it fades, I'm going to invite you to let your attention wander to your ears and notice how many different sounds there are in the room. So I'm just going to go ahead and ring that chime. And after you notice different sounds in the room, 
I'm just going to invite you to see if you can notice what sound is closest and which one might be furthest away. And I'm going to ring the chime one more time. And when the chime fades, I'm just going to invite you to see if you can hear what all the sounds sound like when they blend together, almost as though your ears were taking in a soundscape instead of a visual landscape. And once you've kind of noted whatever you're going to notice about that sound in your room. I'm just inviting you to come back and we'll move on. So this is a summary of a bunch of research on the hypothesized pathways between having access to thriving natural ecosystems and uh, different physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health outcomes on the right-hand side of the slide. And I know there's a lot on this slide. I'm not trying to be overwhelming. I'm just letting you know that there are a whole bunch of different pathways, and I'm about to go over each one in turn. You're welcome to come back to the slide to look at it later. So the first one is attention restoration. And the idea behind this is that there are actually multiple theories about why this happens, but when we spend time in green spaces, what can happen is that we end up feeling like our capacity to pay attention is restored. And the idea behind this is some people think it's that we're distracting ourselves from the mental chatter, that judgment and analysis that our mind does. Some people think that it's actually that that amount of chatter turns down. It's not as engaged because our senses are engaged and interpreting new environments. So there's a lot new, not more information that might be unfamiliar. And so then the mind needs to work on all of that information and it sort of can't be in a thought loop. And another theory about this is actually that we're using different forms of attention and that form of attention actually change what happens in the brain. And this is a type of attention theory. So in this diagram here in the center, the idea is that the most common form of attention we use focuses on one object at a time which is why it's called objective. And it's also narrow. So in order to focus on that one single object at a time, you have to narrow your focus in. And this is where computer work comes from. It's also managing large volumes of information. To a certain degree, sometimes some of the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, like going grocery shopping, will end up using some of this kind of attention as well. And when we, uh, say, for example, go watch a sporting event or are at a concert, our attention may still be narrow in the sense that we're focused on kind of just that thing that's happening right in front of us. But we might also start to feel a little more immersed. Our attention might go to a bunch of different sounds and sights and whatever's going on around us. The other thing that can happen, so for example, if you go and watch the ocean and you're just watching one wave on the ocean, now you're in kind of an objective type of focus where you're just watching that one, one wave. But then what can happen is you can start feeling, it can start spreading out, your attention can spread out where you start to notice several waves all at the same time. And then you watch multiple waves at the same time. And if you've had this experience before, you might notice that your body might feel a little calm after you watch this. And there's, there's a whole bunch of reasons about why this happens having to do with fractals and brain science, and I'm not going to get into that. But the point is, is that this starts to move us over to that bottom right-hand corner where you're, you're starting to feel immersed and part of whatever's going on, as well as your attention diffusing outward. And this is actually related to brain states in, that our mind has that also happen when people are in deep meditation. So it's kind of like a reset of the mind or the brain there's a bunch more research about how it changes brain morphology that I won't get into right now. 
but essentially you can re restore your capacity to pay attention by spending time in nature. Another area of research is immune response. And so there, were, there have been a, a number of studies that are looking at different types of immune response, but here's one that I'm going to focus on because it's focused on forest bathing. So in this particular study, a group of office folk, they got to go on either a three-day adventure trip to spending time in the forest, going on a walk on the, on the first day and two walks in the second day, or they got to go on a sightseeing trip in the city of Nagoya. Also for the same amount of time, same amount of walking, same period of walking. So they were, they were getting lots of physical activity in the same way that you might get otherwise, you know, in being out in nature. So it's not the physical activity that's driving this necessarily. And they, they basically took blood and urine samples at seven days after and 30 days after the trip. And they found that the people who went on the forest bathing walk had an increase in cancer fighting cells and activity in their blood and a decrease in adrenaline in their urine. And adrenaline is related to stress. So they found that the people who went on the sightseeing trip in city did not have a change in NK cell activity, nor did they have a change in adrenaline. And this is partly related to the fact that a lot of us live in cities, that they were kind of asking this question. I'm going to, I just realized that I skipped over this slide. So another study that looked at physical activity and its relationship to stress recovery, as well as being outdoors, was one that people, I think this one was in California, people were, this one was another case control where they, they went on one walk and then they, they had brain scans done before and after the walk and they did a self-report survey and they found that when people went out walking in a mostly unpaved tree and grass covered natural environment for 90 minutes they reported less troubling thinking called rumination and when they took brain scans there was a change in activity in a portion of the brain that we think is related to that type of thinking those who went on a walk in the city did not have a change in rumination and they didn't report that you know, they felt better or anything. They also didn't have more activity in, or less activity in the prefrontal cortex. So the reason they were looking at this is that by, I think it's 2050, 70% of the human population will be living in cities is the estimate. And urbanization is associated with an increase in depression and an, an increase in activity in the prefrontal cortex. So they were really trying to figure out, well, what could happen? And, and in this case, we're seeing that beyond restoring your capacity for attention, time in nature contributes to, to you being more physically active. It can, contributes to faster stress recovery and less kind of internal thinking. And apparently, to some degree, some change in immune response. There's also a body of research that looks at social connection. This is a picture of people out fly fishing and kayaking and canoeing. So if you spend time with your friends outside, this is one of the benefits. It's more social connection. So this particular image series shows vacant lots before and after basically cleaning them up and greening them up, if you will. So because there's this challenge with cities not having, I mean, they basically have a lot more pollution, air pollution, soil, and then less green space, there have been a number of research projects to change that, to basically put greenery back in the city where it had been taken out. And so in this particular study, this they took a hundred, they randomly selected in Philadelphia a hundred vacant lots and put them into, put people into three study groups who either um, lived near a vacant lot that was greened, that only had trash pickup, or that wasn't changed at all. And participants living near all three lot, lots were surveyed at least once before and after any change. And the ones who lived closest to the green lots basically found that they had a significant self-reported reduction in depression and feelings of worthlessness after the lots were greened and, there, and they didn't have the same changes for those where the trash was picked up or there was no change. So this is just an example of why we need more green space and we're still looking at how this 
what this means in the larger picture. I'm going to invite you to think about how this inf if this information matches or differs from your experience of being in green spaces. And that's something you can sort of think about in the back in the background as you go about your day. And I recommend as an applied practice either before or after your forest bathing walk is to listen to Kimberly Ruffin's 45 minute guided offering a forest walk of faith through Emergence magazine and it's linked right there. It'll also be a link in the course web page. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that every forest bathing guide has their own flow, the same way that a jazz musician or rap artist or singer has a unique way that they express and work with whatever the information is to create. Guided mindfulness or forest bathing walk is a type of offering that has a little bit of art to it and it's really cool to be able to hear how people, different people structure different invitations. And I bring this up because in the very third module, you'll be invited to start practicing making some of your own invitations. And it can be really useful to listen to different people in the way they do it so that you can start to play, play around and, and experience it. So you can just click on that link when you're out and about in a park, in a yard, and listen to some of her invitations and just notice how you feel before, during, and after the experience. And if you want to look into some of the research more about the relationship between nature and health, he, these are all a, a whole series of resources for you. And I'm not going to read the whole summary of this slide, but basically this, we just really appreciate you coming out and exploring some of the way that, that you're part of nature and forest therapy as a type of mindfulness practice and how nature contributes to supporting our mental and physical and spiritual and emotional well-being. And I will see you in the next video.